get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a beach If you find the sand And right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, in the software world like Corey, Zapier, A. Weber, and many more. Uh, we talk about not just the successes, but how to overcome and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Um, and this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Um, at Rise25, our mission is to connect you with your best referral partners and customers. Um, we do it in three ways, a done-for-you media, a done-for-you lead generation, and done-for-you VIP events. Um, for the media pieces, it's podcasts like this. We actually help companies completely run and launch their own podcast. Uh, we distribute it across 11 different channels, including a dedicated blog post. And so the person or co-founder or founder can show up and talk, and we do everything else. Um, we've been doing podcasts, working with podcasters since 2009. Um, I personally credit podcasting as the single best thing I've done for my business in my life. It's allowed me to connect with people like Corey, the founders of you know, P90X, Einstein Bagels, Mattel, RX Bars, and many more. And besides making great friends um, and finding my business partner, it's led to a lot of relationship and countless customers and referral partners. So, I mean, my idea for Corey actually is he should start something uh, where let's say for Shedwell, he would uh, reach out to founders or of restaurant chains or whatever the, the position of restaurant chains and he's delivering high quality value content, which you know, you'll, you should follow Corey on LinkedIn anyways because he's uh, is a huge following. He puts out great content, put out great content in the industry that you're serving, but you're also connecting and networking with some of the top people of that industry. So it's just some ways whoever is listening to this can use it for their own uh, company. Um, and so, you know, I'm going to talk about, there's another quick thing that um, this episode is also brought to you by Sticker Mule. And I've never talked about this before, this episode actually, but Sticker Mule has an amazing, they've given me an amazing deal that I'm giving to viewers. Corey, you may even enjoy this, but um, the, uh, I don't know if anyone has heard of Sticker Mule who's listening, but it's one of the easiest, fastest way to buy custom printed products. Um, they work with Amazon, Nike, Google, Netflix, um, and they basically help you upload your logo and you get these really high quality custom stickers. They have an amazing deal that's 10 custom stickers for $1. Um, and they told me if that goes viral, they will shut it down um, because they don't want to give out too many of them. So if you want 10 stickers for your company or whatever the case is for a dollar, it's typically 20, um, go to stickermule.com slash inspired. And, um, if you go there and the offer is not available, it will still default to like $10 off your first order or something like that. So use that, but on to the more important thing today, we have Corey Warfield. He's the co-founder of Shedwell. Um, they're an employee scheduling and workforce management software company. What that basically means is they help staff at companies fill a shift or staff take on an additional shift. So if someone's working at a restaurant and they, they don't have to call up all their buddies and see, can you cover for me? Can you cover for me? They can put it in the schedule schedule and someone can pick it up very easily. And they work with companies and they've, they've been able to work with companies like IBM, American Airlines, BP, Four Seasons, and several other high profile companies. But they also, amazingly enough, I don't know at the time you're listening to this, have a free option, which we will talk about uh, his mentality around that, where even if you're a small company and you need to, you know, have this pain point, you could still use their software. It's not just for huge companies. Um, Corey worked in the hospitality industry for years where he saw the need for a scheduling app like this. So it came from a personal pain point. Um, he's also a seminal team of engineers, developers, and business specialists to bootstrap Shedwell. So go to shedwell.com. It's shed, S-H-E-D-W-O-O-L.com. And uh, Shedwell Schedule, that, that comes from you are a linguist. So I know it, uh, it goes with the territory, but it also makes, me hard, makes it hard for me to uh, say it back to back. <laughs> uh, he's also, if he wasn't busy enough, co-founder of MentorYouGlobal.com. So you could check that out. It's actually a pro bono consulting platform. As you can tell already, Corey has a big heart because 
everything he wants to do, he wants people to use it and he wants to give it away and, and get people access to it. Um, a fun fact about Corey is he is a freestyle rapper as well. So if you see him on the street of Chicago, um, ask him to uh, do a freestyle rap for you. Corey, thanks for joining me. It's an absolute pleasure, Dr. Jeremy. Fan of the show as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wanted to start off with the pain point. Um, there's so many things I want to dig into, but the pain point um, of where the idea came from. I know you've been in the restaurant industry for years and years. So talk about the, that pain point. Yeah, so I spent about 20 years of my life in hospitality, and I, I worked quite literally my way up from dishwasher to F&B director of a national chain. I've done everything from uh, running banquet departments uh, you know, to really anything and everything in between. I spent the majority of my time split between uh, lower management, so restaurant manager, floor manager, uh, and waiter. I spent nearly 10 years uh, waiting tables. It was where the most money was. Uh, every time I left uh, being a waiter, I'd see the people under me making more money than myself and often having more fun. And so I, I defaulted to that. But in the restaurant industry, in the hospitality industry, quite literally every establishment every day of the year is having staffing issues. And it's really, it's amplified this time of year uh, twofold. Uh, these last few weeks with the holidays, they never know if they're going to need 30 waiters or 15 waiters, and half the staff is on call, and they don't know if they're going to be free with their family until 1 p.m. that day. Totally. They have too many people come in, and sometimes they have someone who's opening the next day, closing that night, and the morale just suffers, and people are making less money, and people don't want to be there that wanted to be there, and people that needed to be there are getting called off, and it's just, it's such a moving target, right? And I've never worked a day in my life in the restaurant industry, even in $10 million a year departments that were perfectly staffed. And what oh. makes that worse is not only are there people that wanted to work or didn't in that establishment on that team, but there are also people in that community that would love to have picked up another job. So people have said, after we kind of uh, perfect this scheduling component, we think we're about there. Uh, we, we've established a big partner in the space to actually leverage it as an online temp agency as well. So soon a restaurant can get a qualified bartender mm, hostess on a Saturday cool. night. Um, it's really awesome. It's really the, the tech that goes behind that's been uh not a challenge, but it's been a really, a really awesome uh, journey, and uh, it's been a, been quite a challenge that that we've uh, we've really started to solve for with some machine learning and the algorithm of just who is available, qualified that wants to work, and how do we broadcast that out and really turn it into a holistic shift scheduling platform, both for businesses and individuals. So, being that the scheduling in the holidays is so crazy, well, now it's January. There are restaurants that won't have a single person come in today, and they're going to have four waiters standing around doing nothing. And they're paying those waiters a very nominal amount of money per hour, but uh, the morale, again, is down. They're, they're, they're spending money on labor uh, that they didn't need to. They had data in their reservation systems, POS, anything like that that could have helped forecast. So we understood that a shift scheduling platform could not only really help optimize labor and earnings for smaller and larger businesses. And some of the bigger companies that we have piloting our software or in our pipeline we quite literally could optimize tens of millions of dollars of labor for them annually. It's uh, some of these larger franchises, they're wasting so much money every day, either on having too many people on the clock, which costs mm. some extra money, or not having enough people on the clock, which also costs some money. If you're a Dunkin' Donuts and you don't have enough people to make enough donuts, the line gets longer, people leave, people don't come back, and they don't order totally. as much. And so, you know, we, we really... We, we, we started solving for labor through the scheduling lens. And about three years ago, I waited my last table and, uh, you know, we popped some really nice champagne and I kind of took a 20, 20 year bow and, uh, and left the industry to start Shedwell. And it took us about two years to start generating revenue. Uh, I, we'd been in a soft launch with an MVP product for about six months at that time. We were a free product and, and my, my goal was to always have a free uh, version of the product. Uh, now that I've brought on a little bit outside capital and started to grow my, my board, um, but they've told me that the perceived value isn't even there. And it's very difficult to sell something that doesn't cost money. And the, the time-saving uh, proposal yeah. and, and the, the fact that we can save companies not only money, but also time and help optimize, uh, we think is, is very valuable. So we're moving away from that model that said, any listener of the show, if yeah. they're just that's why just I was like, at the time because I definitely <laughs> had conversations with software founders on here, and I'm like, you, you need to charge because your your software is super valuable, and I always, I like to pay personally because I know, and you got this feedback because I know they're going to be around, I know they're going to be able to support it, the customer service and the platform. So I'd rather pay than take a free, free version, you know. 
Exactly. And we're finding that's the way with all the bigger clientele that are looking to come on board. They were on the sidelines when we were free. They didn't trust we'd still be around two years later. And now they're reaching out and going, not only are you guys around, but you've got intercom and we see your ads on social media. And, you know, it's become evident that we're, we're a real player in the workforce management space. But uh, I think one of the ways that they really know that we're serious is to go to the website and they see the pricing. Um, but that said, uh, I want to honor what you said. I also want to give a gift to any of your any of your listeners that do have shift workers or companies that could benefit. So anyone that mentions your show, I'll honor with three free months completely amazing. and and 50% off for the rest of the year if they find value in our software. And I'll, I'll honor that even at our current pricing of $39 a month per location, which is, you know, we never wanted to compete on price after we stopped being free. Uh, but, but we are one of the most reasonably priced platforms on the market at that price point anyhow. We are in the process of revamping, and we're going to have to start charging per user. It's what everyone else in the yeah. space does. And, so right and now so, it's per location? or co- Correct. Yeah. And uh, anyone, again, that mentions this show within the first few months of 2019, I'll honor that location pricing, and I'll honor the three months free just to kind of prove that out. And um, I, I'm sure my board would probably have me put a limit on it, so I'll put in something crazy like a 1,000 you know, to 1,000 uh, workers. You can get it free for three months. Um, so talk about... I want to talk about the shift and why you decided on free originally, but let's go, let's fast forward to now um, as far as charging and then per user. How do you decide when to, okay, we're doing per location now. How do you decide when and what to charge for shift per user? So a lot of it is just optics. A lot of it is if you go to a website and see $39 a month and, and you have a lot of uh, per location, you have a lot of locations that seems like it could add up very quickly and it seems very expensive. But if you go to a website and see a dollar a month per user, it, you, you might not necessarily think about the fact that you've got 50 employees per location. And you're going to pay a mm-hmm. lot more. That smaller dollar amount seems to be very attractive. And we had a, a competitor in our space uh, it's, this just about a year ago today was acquired by Intuit QuickBooks for $346 million. And we kind of dug into why, because we realized our platforms are very similar. We have a lot of the same value proposition. And we actually had some of our clients that said they had demoed both and they chose to come with us instead. And we said, well, what's the big difference other than the fact that they have a lot of users? Well, they're making a lot more money. Why is that? All they're charging per user. And it became very, very crystal clear. So we put together a couple studies and talked to a lot of our existing users. And, um, you know, we got a little bit of pushback. But for the most part, people understand that model. And it seems to be every company uh, in our space has moved toward that model as well. Um, so it just seems to be in keeping with the times. And, you know, it's not just that we can pick more money up off the table, but it actually then it becomes even more valuable to the smaller companies as well as the larger companies. And you know, we probably shouldn't charge a $10 million uh, a year company, the same thing we're charging a company doing 300 grand and in, in, in top line revenue. So it, it really just seems to be, you know, what, what the market is going toward mm-hmm. for all the right reasons. And, and we, we don't want to get left behind or, you know, be the yeah. odd man out. So Corey, is there, is there a development challenge with that as far as keeping track and monitoring, um, you know, like right now, you just they just have a hundred people go on. Is there a development piece that goes into that now? Okay, you're paying for up to fifty, and you're only getting fifty people logging in. Um, no, we have we have good metrics on that. So right now, it's been super easy to just charge per location. Um, and we offer two two week free trial for anyone just to make sure that they like the product and the the, the UI and um, all that. But uh, and we, we've been adding features, about one or two features a week we're adding right now. So we, we just launched a white label feature for free uh, or for no additional charge where you can turn it into your colors and put your company's logo mm. in the top corner. So Dunkin' Donuts can log in and any franchise location, it'll, it'll look like it's a Dunkin' Donuts schedule or not ours. We love that. We just launched an a, a integration with Alexa and with Google Home and with Google Calendar. But all these things are leveraging different data points that we have living in our ecosystem. And so we have that data readily available for what location is, how many employees. We'll be able to make that switch. And we've now got our dev team is amazing. I mean, our, our CTO is my co-founder, and he, he built a lot of the original tech, and he's fantastic as well. But now he's got the support that he needs to you know be able to build any integration, uh, extrapolate anything. So with, with the pricing, it's going to be seamless. We yeah. just need to make sure that, that the people that we've been talking to for a number of months don't feel blindsided. And, you know, a lot of the stuff kind of behind the scenes. So I want to talk about the evolution of the pricing. So we kind of, fa- that's fast forward to today, right? The industry is basically people charge per user and that's standard. And, you know, you're doing it the industry pretty much, 
is is demanding and it also builds trust and credibility by doing that too with the companies you're going after but go back rewind back to when you first started what was the mentality and why the free well you know for, first and foremost i was a first time founder and so you, you kind of have those growing pains but i also really wanted to disrupt the industry and ever since day one i've wanted to get into this temp staffing component where with the push of a button you can bring a qualified a uh, roofer, a qualified security guard, or whatever it is. And we've really been adopted by some one-off industries, which we love. We have hospitals and police departments using us, and uh, we have festivals using us seasonally. And, you know, for, for a music festival, but to be able to hire people to come in and sell beer or to collect tickets is, is a huge value prop. It's expensive for them to find those people, especially totally. to qualify them. So I'd always known that we were going to have this staffing component that's quite monetizable, right? I mean, it's that's baked right into, into that. You can effectively take up to a dollar per worker per hour and you hit a market aggressively. And so we were going to be able to make far more than our competitors without having to charge a penny. And, you know, I, I, I say that I'm saying this candidly, but I'm not because I know how many people this is going out to. But I would have kept that model if we could. The reality is we never raised any money on the free. Uh, the growth was slower than we'd anticipated, even with a pretty stellar product. And again, to your point, people just didn't trust the free. And, and there were people that were hearing, OK, we, we understand that you want to do this down the road. We can't access it now and or we don't see ourselves using it. So then it get, gets back to the point of if we need you guys to build a feature for us and you're a free product and we're not your, your core demographic because we're not hiring workers, where where do we fit in, right? I think a lot of people are really struggling with how they were going to felt loved on. And so, you know, we started to put things like Intercom and now we're 24-7. You can push a button on the apps or the website and people started to like that. And uh, But now that I think we're charging, I think the perception is much different. I think people are understanding that that's going to be a value yeah. add that, that is at their disposal and our, our partner with that is a, a Fortune 50 company. So it's, you know, they're, they're really bullish on getting us ahead of the curve. They're here in Chicago exclusively yet as well. And uh, but so I think once we bake things like that and we're, we're getting ready to launch a geofence where you can clock in and out through the app and integrate with other payroll solutions and we're building our own payroll solution. And, you know, all these things that I'd always roadmapped to do that are revenue drivers. And that's why I'd wanted to be free. I just wanted eyeballs on the site. I just wanted users on the platform. Uh, I really wanted to become kind of the go-to scheduling, uh, you know, platform for these for these managers and these workers. And uh, I really thought the K factor, the virality factor of having a free product would work. But it, it's fun, right? After we launched, we had Microsoft and Facebook both try to launch free employee scheduling platforms as well. Those both fell flat on their face. Microsoft, their uh, their kind of go-to-market strategy was that anyone that was a subscriber of 365 could use their free platform, but 365 is so expensive and shift workers don't use it. So there was that disconnect. With Facebook, they probably could have done it very well, but they bought a company called, uh, it must have been called Band, and it was for initially for musicians to find each other and jam with each other around the city, but they bought it and tried to turn it into a staffing platform, but people just, they, they didn't trust the name. They, they went and they saw mixed branding on it, and so that never took off. But we had a, a, a competitor here uh, out of the Midwest that's raised, I think they just raised $10 million, but they're pretty big in this space, but they downloaded Shedwell when we were still free, played with it for two weeks, and two weeks later, they changed their entire pricing model to be free for up to, I want to say, 49 employees or something. And I don't think that we changed their model. I think they were just looking to see who was doing kind of a free or a freemium hybrid. Right. Uh, but their their model makes a lot of sense as well. Get people using them, and once you grow big enough, then they actually yeah. charge you quite a bit of money. But I think for me, as long as we're always, uh, I, I want to be priced very reasonably because we do have additional revenue drivers that our competitors don't. Uh, and, and I don't want things to add up too quickly and to kind of become that a la carte software platform. It's like, well, if you really want to take advantage of said, well, it's going to cost right. you half your right. half your company's G. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I'm not there. I always want to make sure that we're accessible to anyone. Yeah. And, uh, I, I've also always said that any nonprofit, any humanitarian organization, anything like that can use our software at every premium level completely for free. Um, I'd love to help any humanitarian uh, initiatives that I can. We're part of 1% for the planet. And so although we are a for-profit company and, and we are moving more and more toward generating revenue and being able to kind of uh, reinvest in the company to generate more revenues. And, you know, we have the, the fiduciary responsibilities now, but at the end of the day, we really are here just to help people yeah. and, you know, and to help businesses and to help, help business owners in every way that we can. You know, and, and you're a mentor to, you know, entrepreneurs as well. And, and I listened to one of your, um, your lectures and your talks 
and you talk about this concept of basically it sounds simple but not we don't all do it and there's an ego involved in it which is listening to your customer and you had talk about some of the feedback you were getting early on you you mentioned briefly like some of the larger companies were just saying they just didn't trust the free so what was some of the feedback they were giving which allowed you to change the pricing or the product for the better yeah, I think you, you you articulated it perfectly. They were worried we weren't going to be in business in six months. They were worried, rightfully so, that we weren't going to be able to raise any money. And, and so to, to kind of have that sustainable model, they just weren't seeing it. Um, they weren't necessarily understanding the big picture, which is probably because it was convoluted and, and probably we didn't need to be you know selling selling trucks for a semi to someone that was trying to buy a Corvette, right? I mean, it's I think we, we were probably just a little bit off-brand, um, you know, I think I was probably a little too focused on the free, uh, and I think that was the feedback we were hearing: is that people didn't didn't believe, especially in an enterprise type software solution, uh, a B two B solution. Free, free just kind of leaves a bad taste in your mouth, or too many doubts, and people just rather pay a little bit of money to not have those concerns. And so we were hearing that front and center, and people mm-hmm. were taking us for a ride, you know, in a good way, taking us taking us for a test drive. And going, hey, we actually really like the product. We really like you as a founder. But uh, who else works for the company but you and your and your CTO? And it's like, no, that's it. And, and they were literally saying, you know, call us when you have a support team, and mm. you know, call call us when you've got got an account manager or whatever it is. So I think people just wanted to see that growth. Mm. What was their feedback on how much you should charge? Because I know some of them said we want to pay you. Yeah. So basically, what we've heard from people is if they've used a similar software solution or a competitor before. Whatever price they're accustomed to is what they're expecting. Um, I think that with with the with the the per user model, it's easy to kind of come in a little bit on the low end without seeming to have as much of a delta, right? So if other people are charging two dollars a user, or we're at a dollar a user, you know, then then I think it seems like oh, they cost a little bit less with a, with a, a similar offering. Let's give them right. a shot. Whereas right now, if someone's charging two hundred fifty dollars a month, like one of our closest competitors, and then they see us for thirty nine dollars a month, they think there's still that perceived value. Totally, I'd, ra- I'd rather pay the extra two hundred dollars a month to get a better product. And it's now uh, I-, I don't want to talk bad on anyone, but but we have a lot of people kind of coming almost on mass from that competitor to our software, saying, "Wow, you guys do this and this and this that these guys don't do." And by the way, you cost way less, and that's awesome. Um, so I think we just kind of, like you said, listening to the to the not even our our individual customers as much as the market itself, and just looking to see what some of our our target or, or our, the de- the demographic we're going after, what they are already currently paying for similar solutions, and uh, it's it's been a really powerful transformation. Yeah, and Corey, in a, in a short period of time, you've attracted some very large companies. What's your favorite story of how you got in the door with some of these? I mean, like I listed, you know, IBM, American Airlines, BP, Four Seasons. What's one of your favorite stories of getting in the door? Because someone's like, well, even if it's free, it's hard to maybe get in the door at one of these big companies, whether you're charging or not. And I'm going to I'm going to not use names just in case um, they, they don't want me to. But I got a message on LinkedIn from someone saying, uh, you know, by by the way, I'm a fan. I've been looking at your content and your videos for some time and. You really helped me, you know, in you know some some of my journey, and 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 I, I've just retired from senior senior leadership, so top one percent leadership, part of one one of the largest telecommunication country uh, companies in the country, and uh, I'm senior vice president of, of this multi billion dollar company. And, and by the way, they have shift workers. I think they could really use shed wall. And uh, so she made an intro to, to her uh, the next week. I was in their boardroom. They're outside of Chicago, and now we're in talks with three different opportunities with them. Uh, they'd represent our first million dollar uh, client, and so that was just kind of from putting out content on LinkedIn and engaging with people. You never know, you know, who's watching you, and so that was a great one. And uh, also the Global Accelerator Network that I uh, went through their first post accelerator. They've been pretty valuable in making some intros as well. What about early on with one of the ones that maybe just how did you approach them? To, it sounded like you wanted them to pilot it. Well, so interestingly enough, uh, when it was just my co-founder and I, I had no experience in sales, no experience in marketing, no experience in anything. So we didn't do anything outbound at all. Uh, so our users like BP, Four Seasons, they literally just found us organically. Really? And, you know, we, were, we were able to get some some good reviews from early users kind of on Captera and I think Trustpilot and the app stores and um, so I think they, when they were searching, and I will say that the reason that some of our earlier uh, users, like the FedEx Fulfillment Center and the BP Gas Station, uh, 
they actually found us because they were searching for free. So, so being free mm. in an early oh. stage did serve us well from that SEO, almost that unintentional SEO uh, perspective. We did have people looking just to see if there was anything free. And then, you know, we'd always come up on the, the top five or top 10 for that. And then we were well enough rated. So it was all inbound. And I do think it was from the from the, the early free stage that, you know, it didn't serve us well ultimately, but I think it did serve us well in that early capacity. On. So at the time, were you putting out a lot of content on LinkedIn like you do now or not really? None. And no. then uh, not only was I putting out no content, I, I then realized that it was a potential traction channel for us. And I, I spent about five months on LinkedIn posting probably two, three times a week, engaging with probably 10 people a day. And I had nothing. I had probably 700 followers and my posts were literally getting zero to two likes each. And for whatever reason, I just stuck with it. I was diligent. I, I understood that all it took was some time and some some uh, some strategy. And next thing you know, I started getting 10 likes on every post. And then the, the 10 turned into 50, the turned into 100. And you know, now I think I'm averaging you know, somewhere between three and 500 likes on most posts. And I still have the rogue post that gets 100 likes, just like I have the rogue post that gets 3,000. But, but you know, it's, yeah. it's just been this steady growth. And I've become really strategic about making sure that I engage with everyone that, that kind of, you know, speaks my language, has a similar heart or is like-minded, but also really getting strategic with decision makers at some of our target companies. So it's not uncommon that I tag the decision makers at, you know, some of the larger retailers or hospitality chains in the country and then start start dialogue with them in the comments that turns into a DM that turns into a, uh, you know, potential sales pitch with my team. So it's been highly effective totally. for us. I mean, like I mentioned in the front of the interview, one of the things we do is the done for you, the lead generation, and we help people. We are strong advocates and users of, of LinkedIn. So I think everyone, anyone who has a business should be on LinkedIn. You know, they think it's just for, oh, if I'm hiring someone or if I'm trying to get a job, it's not. It is, in my opinion, one of the best business development, relationship development tools you can use right now. Um, and so... Talk about, I want you to talk about a post that you made that was huge. I was talking to Ian Garlic, shout out to Ian Garlic, um, the uh, Garlic Marketing Show. He's awesome. And he introduced Corey and I. And, um, but he was like, this guy, he got like 250,000 views on one of his posts. We'll, we'll talk about, and you're going to give a talk to uh, kind of uh, a group of people, um, probably some people from LinkedIn, not in LinkedIn. Um, but talk about that post. 250,000 views. Uh, what'd you do? What were you, what was the post about? And then we'll talk a little bit about how you grew your following. Like you said, you start off, you know, there's two likes, 10 likes, and now there's 500. So what was that one post that was recent? Uh, what was that about? Yeah. So I, at first, I wasn't sure which post you were talking about because I've had that happen probably five or six okay, times. You're like, um, I have too many of those, Jeremy. Like, I have, like, I averaged 250,000 views. No, it, it, and it used to be. So the way that I started to get traction and, and started to get some of those numbers is the same way that I got my first couple posts that would do over 100,000 views. And it was all really similar, and I can go into that. But um, first, to answer your specific question, that post that you're referencing was just a few weeks ago. And something that I'd love to do on my content is I'd love to keep it a little bit controversial. I'd love to talk about things that I care about, like gender equality and diversity and inclusion and all those things. Um, but I also love to have a first line that grabs you. And so the, the, the line, the first line of that post was, uh, please don't call me, sir. And then, um, you know, the, the next line was, unless you're my banker and don't know my name or, you know, and it was a little bit sarcastic, but it was basically saying, please don't call me, sir. And there's, I, I knew it would be slightly contentious. It was somewhat in response to all the people kind of from certain parts of the world. You know, any of us uh, from, from the states that are on LinkedIn often get those messages all day, every day. Hi, sir, can you please give me a job? Hi, sir, can you please just send me $1,000? Hi, sir, can you sponsor me and my family to get work visas? And, you know, hi, sir, this and hi, sir, that's stop it. Yeah, it's, it's just calling me sir isn't going to make me send you money. It's not going to make me, you know, hire you over someone else. It's, it's, it's almost as just this desperate vibe. Mm. And, um, 
you know, I think oh, I also in the post I said, and also please don't call me boss. They said to me it stinks of racism, and I, you know, don't call me boss if I'm not your boss. And if I am your boss, then, then you've got ten things you'd rather call me that I'd rather you call me than boss. It's not the culture. It's not unless you're a used car salesman and you think I can't afford anything other than an '89 Honda Civic, then don't call me boss, <laughs> right? And so that was kind of the nature of this post, but it did really well because it inspired conversation, and um, it's one of those things where it used to be in order to get you know, over 100,000 views on a post, I needed to have one of the people on the platform that had a million followers come like it and comment on it. And I was fortunate. There's really only two of those people on the platform that I know of right now that aren't like, you know, Mark Zuckerberg or something. And uh, they both took a liking to me. So I got lucky there. And I say lucky, but it took me about three months to get Oleg and Bridget both to kind of you know, know who I was, give a damn about me, and then start to really, uh, to, to really engage with me. And Oleg once did a post about me um, and his post went well, but next thing you know, I had 50,000 people checking out my profile mm. and, and all that as well. So um, the strategy was kind of influencer strategy, targeting Oleg and Bridget, following them, liking every single one of their posts, commenting on every single one of their posts, making sure that they knew my name, knew I was adding value to them. And uh, I, did that, I did that really strategically, really uh, w without failure as an option. It took me maybe a month or two to get on their radars and you know, next thing you know, people are tagging me alongside it. You know, there are a lot of people that will end their post by tagging Corey, then Oleg, then Bridget, and that's it. You know, like, those are the three they care about now. And, you know, people keep you know, saying, like, oh, what are you going to do with your influence? Or you're such an influencer. And I, not yet. You know, I'm probably on my way. They, they both got a million people that see their stuff when they post. I'm nowhere near that yet. But I do like putting out what I consider to be quality content, thought provocative content. Um, I. I've started to get pretty good about sneaking in something about, and by the way, if you've got a company with shift workers, I want to save a million yeah. bucks. This year. Yeah, because LinkedIn is a professional platform. If you're not at least promoting what you do professionally, then you're kind of missing the missing the ball, I think. Totally. Um, and so you said there were a couple steps from going from whatever, 5,000, 7,000, 15,000, 30,000, 40,000 followers. What are some of the key things it's it sounded like one thing was you saw who was producing great content and who had you know a lot of influence and you basically gave to them you commented and you liked what they did what else did you find worked with growing your your audience and following so the only other thing that i can say worked for me really well and it was really a source of contention and stress for me for some time but is to get to know your network personally and it got to where i'm like I don't have 40 hours a week to be on the phone and video conferencing with strangers because I have 40 hours a week to do it. You know, but it turns out you just have to make that time. And I think mm -hmm. once I started getting on more and more calls and more podcasts and just even doing videos where people can get to know you, I've, I've got thousands of people that swear they know me because they, they tune in once or twice a week and they hear what I have to say and they've heard my voice and they've looked in my eyes, right? And so kind of any of those touch points. But for me, it was about finding the right influencers, and that was Bridget and Oleg. Um, the algorithm now does not favor them, so I have Bridget and Oleg commenting on my post lately, and it doesn't change the performance at all. Mm. Um, so what I what I found is now it's about the micro influencer like myself. If if I if someone gets me to like and comment on their post in their first 15, 20 minutes, so I'll get thousands, if not tens of thousands, mm. of additional views, almost always. And you can tell your post is doing well because you start to see second connections liking and commenting, and then you start to see third connections and. If you see a third connection liking or commenting on your post, that means LinkedIn loved it and they're showing it to everybody because mm. there's no legitimate reason um, <laughs> that, that a person that doesn't know anyone that knows you should have seen anything of yours on their feed. And that happens fairly common. And so I'm, I'm in one of those groups where if, if I if I get involved in a post at the right time, then people start to see those second connections. And, and if, if, if those do well, then LinkedIn just opens the floodgates for them. And <clears throat> I probably helped somewhere in the neighborhood. At this point, we're probably going to be closer to a thousand people go viral, especially with their first video or job seekers. I've helped a lot of job seekers get their current mm -hmm. jobs and it, just all about engaging. I've got a, a lady, she, she just surpassed me in followers, which I love. I love some of us have this kind of little competitive thing going on, but I'm at like 38 and change uh follow thousand followers right now she just broke forty thousand. but uh she messaged me just to say hey corey by the way i grew by a thousand followers uh since last night and it's been like eight hours extra thousand followers mm -hmm. and we all we all share little tips and tricks but i didn't even ask her how because uh, i i know i see what she's doing she's spending even more time than i am just <laughs> engaging with everybody but i didn't ask and she clearly wanted to tell me so the next message she said she said heavily engaged with a smile and that's all it takes if you're if you're on there commenting on a lot of other people's stuff, 
that's literally adding value to them. You're cool. quite literally in 15 seconds offering value to somebody. And if you can do that a thousand times a day and add value to a thousand people a day, and if you do that five times a week, seven times a week, you're planting so many seeds. And you know the upside to that is everyone's seeing your name. And if your posts are witty or if they're value added as well, <coughs> sky's the limit. And so that that's what I did. I, I spent probably... You know, people people sometimes even get mad when they hear this. I and my my wife had to deal with it, but I probably spent sixty hours a week on LinkedIn, yeah. um, every day or every week for six months. Um, and that's probably she's how like, I, you haven't I, done I the dishes. How are you post? How are you commenting on a thousand people's profiles? You haven't done the dishes yet. I, I've gotten well, that. God, I've gotten thank that. Thank God I would get no, dishes if she doesn't beat me to them. But yeah. What I was gonna say is niches in customers, right? Because you could. There's a lot of people that need what you have. Right. I mean, I could think of them. I don't know the space as well as you, obviously, but I could think of there's restaurants, there's stadiums, there's airlines, there's franchises. You mentioned hospitals, police. How you can't go after everyone. How do you decide on who you double down on? So we've just brought on a strategist from the healthcare space. Uh, we, we've got myself as our hospitality expert, but we're really trying to solve each industry uh, with one team member. So internally, uh, next thing you know, if if you you know, and I I don't know I don't know what your PhD is in, but as a doctor going to shed will site very soon, you would probably see the hospital come up as the use case on in your background. Whereas if I went there and my cookies suggest that I'm a certified sommelier, I'm going to see the restaurant use case. And so we've built this really adaptable platform that can be used for virtually any use case. We have call centers looking at using us. We have uh, sports teams looking at using us. Um, actually, we have a few sports teams, university teams that, that have been using the product. Um, but I think what, what we did holistically is through the restaurant lens, I said, how, what, what, what do I wish the competitors would have done in the hospitality space that they didn't? And then how could that affect people in the non-restaurant space? So we definitely looked at it through the hospitality lens, but we always wanted to make it a little bit broader of a stroke and a little bit more of an adoptable platform. So we do like the drag and drop, uh, you know, ship, ship building, we do ship notes on them. We have a media upload component. And some of those aren't as inherently restaurant or hospitality centric, but then we work backwards and we can solve for that. So, okay, we have a media upload. What could we use for, for restaurants with that? Okay. That could be a pre-shift meeting, and now people don't have to come in half an hour early on the clock. Uh, for the medical industry, we can have a patient's chart there, and we have, we have a partner that, that can uh, make us a HIPAA-compliant ecosystem for those that need us to be compliant for HIPAA and you know, things of that nature. So I think we've just really tried to identify pain points per industry and then solve for all of them. Uh, but, but to kind of your earlier point, to people that are looking at starting something from scratch or, or taking their companies to the next level, you're right, the quote, that I always uh, cite is that you can't boil the ocean and you definitely don't want to do what I did and go after 15 industries at once. We really had to focus and say, okay, let's solve for restaurants first. And then because we have some hospitals using us, then let's start to solve for that use case. And I think we're still in that iterative process. I think the construction industry is a big one that wants to adopt uh, as far as uh, construction sites and, and things of that nature. So we're talking to some of the larger construction companies and that'll be probably what we solve for uh, after the after the hospitality and then the uh, the healthcare, are those the two most popular, Corey? Right now, the hospitality and healthcare. It seems like it. Uh, law enforcement. We we have police department, we have security companies, and we have fire departments all using us as well. And so that seems to be kind of an underserved opportunity as well. But they seem to be a little bit more nuanced. And so I think you know they they may be a big opportunity for us, but probably in the near future, uh, not quite yet. Yeah. I want you to talk a little bit about the feature. I think it's really cool um, integrating. Talk about integrating with you, know, you integrate with different platforms. Specifically about, I th it's pretty interesting to talk about integrating with the temp agency. So not only do you feel a need for the staff to cover shifts, but now you can bring on potential talent for companies too. How does that work for a company if they want to use uh, Shedwell? Yeah. So our, our partner with that. Uh, is here in Chicago. They're called Moonrise, and they're fantastic. And effectively, as a manager is putting together a schedule, if it's a busy Saturday and they've got five hostesses, uh, maybe they need six to run most effectively. Right now, they're just getting all five, and they're running understaffed. They're not turning tables as quickly. Their waiters aren't making enough money. Well, we're here in Chicago. There are thousands of women across the city that work as hostesses, and any given night, 
you know, dozens to hundreds of them are off, and some of them might be looking to work an extra shift. And so with our media upload, we can actually have a few things like a floor plan, a couple things to really bring them up to speed, and mm -hmm. we can broadcast out to anyone that works as a host is on the platform in that market that's off that day that's indicated that they like another shift. And so it gets really specific. So we're only telling the people that want to work as a host this that night, and we're broadcasting out, and then they can bid on the shift based on where they work. Mm. Um, you know, a little bit of gamification. We don't want to get too into, you know, why one person would be better than the other per se, but and give that talent pool straight to the management. And, and what we're actually doing with Moonrise is we're going to let them determine the worker, not the restaurant itself or not the employer themselves, so that they don't need to actually go through and try to qualify and make a selection. Our machine learning and their, their, their process will do that for them. So basically push this button and you've got a, you've got a hostess coming in tonight, you know, from, from 7 to midnight, and they're going to come in knowing the table numbers and the workflow or whatever it is because you have the media upload component. So that button at least currently is going to say, uh, uh, so you're, you're making a schedule, you can assign a shift to a worker, you can assign it as a free shift for your workers to pick up, or you can literally deploy that to, to, the, to the outside workforce with the push of the button. It'll say fill with moonrise. That's amazing, by the way. I mean, it's like Uber for shifts almost. Yep. That's, that's exactly what people are saying. Uber for work is what they're calling us. That's, that's remarkable. Um, and they don't have to add that on. If they're a Shedwell customer, that could happen because there's integration there? Or do they have to Precisely. turn the integration on? No, it'll just be in the ecosystem. Um, it'll be something that an admin can toggle on and off. So if they don't have any interest in that, we don't want to, you know, to confuse or confound their experience, but it'll be available to anybody. And uh, in, our, in our launch, we're looking to launch at the end of this quarter with Moonrise. We're just kind of uh, tying up a few loose ends and we're, we're growing a little bit more critical mass in their exact niches in this market because they're Chicago only, and they really like to play in the hospitality space. And so uh, we're ramping up on that so that it makes sense and that starts to offer first-time users of that service through Shedwell uh, a shift or two for free. So that'll be a huge value for people to come on and try the platform, uh, and it'll be a huge revenue uh, driver for both of us, but it'll also be a good way for, for new businesses to find out about Moonrise and what they offer as well. Yeah. Um, Corey, I'm going to come back to Shedwell for a second, but um, I want you to talk about MentorUGlobal.com. Um, you know, pro bono platform, what is it? What does it do? And it sounds like you already have a lot of mentors ready to ready to go. Yeah, so, so we're, we're right around the 100 mentor mark. We've actually had to pump our brakes a little bit because we are in pre-launch, but we have about 100 mentors. Uh, right now, I have a number of them mentoring each other in different disciplines just to kind of sharpen steel, but we have delivered about 100 hours, uh, maybe just over, of video recorded pro bono sessions as well. And effectively, we're a video content creation platform. Every session is video recorded so it can be repurposed. Ben, you know, others can benefit from it, mastermind courses, e-learning, uh, a lot of those components as well. Uh, we're baking in an in-person uh, platform where we'll do a live stream that's also video captured. But it's effectively uh, a way to connect people with mentors and consultants from everything from financial to lifestyle. We have life coaches, wellness coaches. We have legal coaches. And if people have some, some kind of lightweight legal questions, give them a pro bono session. And it's, it's not a, a revenue driver. It's not to to fill their pipeline. It's literally just to pay it back, pay it forward and get people, you know, using some machine learning to the right consultant so we don't have anyone wasting anyone else's time. That said, we have a marketplace. We have a hiring component. We're going to be helping veterans of every country worldwide with their CVs, resumes and job placement for no. Uh, we don't take any cut for the hiring or anything like that. But kind of the, the sweet spot in addition to the to the pay it forward, I mean, it truly is altruistic. Uh, and then the fact that we will be able to monetize uh, the content, but the big kind of secret sauce, and what I get excited about is that we're leveraging the ecosystem and the platform as an online accelerator. So three-tier business accelerator, anyone can come to us completely free pro bono in an ideation stage, kind of tier one. We'll give them consultants, business development specialists, uh, strategists, and we'll help them with product market fit, uh, competitive research, business model canvassing. Um, you know, really kind of see if there are some legs. If so, help help them learn how to walk a little bit and, and let them graduate from that tier as a graduate of the Mentor You Accelerator. Now we have a second tier where they can apply, and if we accept them, we start to roll up our sleeves, help them with wireframing or tooling, start to help them with some prototyping and mock-ups. We have legal 
consultants that will help them with the corporate formation, um, financial uh, projections and modeling, business modeling, things of that nature, and really help set them up for success. And upon graduation of that program, we do take a 2% equity position in the company. They haven't spent a penny. We've gotten them ahead of the curve that a lot of people would have needed to raise capital prior to achieve. Uh, and from then, they they can go on on their own, and we've begun to develop our portfolio. Well, we then have a double opt-in tier three, where we would have, we would invite graduates of the tier two to apply. Uh, those that are accepted, we then have developers, we have programmers, architects, we have everyone that would need to kind of step in and fill the the C-level roles to grow the company. Uh, people can come in as a CFO, a CMO, help build their website, uh, make it SEO enhanced, start to help with some of the actual. Uh, Google ranking, start to really make intros in their space, get them ahead on every level. We then take a 3% ownership in the company. So every one of those companies, we already have a 2% ownership stake in. We, we then graduate and we own 5% of the company. We have an early stage investment fund if we need to seed any of the companies. Although, you know, really the model is to help them be sustainable and be able to bootstrap and get them all to that revenue mark that they need to be at. Yeah, and, and so uh, if we have to place money into a company, we'll get some early investor rights. We'll have even more upside. But kind of that 5% of every company that we can launch, that model excites me to no end. We've got a couple. We've got three companies that are in that process already that I'm incredibly excited about. And uh, what we're doing with the 3% in Tier 3 is we're distributing distributing that among the dedicated mentors. So now if you're a mentor as a Tier 3 uh, accelerator mentor you if you're working with 10 companies help launch them you're going to have a number of shares in all 10 of those companies mm. so our mentors grow their portfolio we grow our portfolio we help people bring their ideas to life kind of get rid of all the barriers to entry and so it that alone is enough to sustain the entire rest of the model and and the fact that we do have the marketplace and we are building the social proof for our mentors candidly a lot of our consultants need more people endorsing and recommending them on linkedin and saying they're a great consultant so if we hook them up with, with 10, 20, 30 mentees, let them deliver those sessions. And, and one of the things that we do ask in addition to the video uh, content being captured is that people do go on and, and offer a recommendation and endorsement after a positive session. So it's really just a great way to grow visibility and get that social proof as well. But at that tier three, growing companies, having stake and upside and skin in the game, and I think is really why I get so excited in addition to just being able to help people with things that they couldn't have afforded and probably needed, you know, like, like, like the counseling or, or even people that just need that financial coach. They, they, they would have never spent money. Someone that needs a financial coach will never spend money on a financial coach. Well, you, you come you know, get up with financial coach for a couple of sessions. You won't pay a penny. And, you know, so we were really excited about just all the potential there. You weren't busy enough. So what made you take this on? Well, I came up with the idea with another consultant, and she said, you know, Corey, I see you helping so many people on LinkedIn. I'm doing the same thing. Do you ever get tired? I said, I don't get tired at all, but I get the wrong people coming. So I just got off the phone with the guy who wanted me to help him with his manufacturing concept. I have no clue. I don't know about tooling or drop ship or cost of goods sold. I'm a SaaS guy, right? I put together software companies, and you know, th then I grow them from, from a sales and strategy perspective. I don't know anything about this, and we were on the phone for an hour. I said, I booked off an hour, 10 minutes in, it was very evident that I had nothing to offer the guy. I have so many people in my network that are in manufacturing. I would have loved to have had some machine learning. You know, this was my, my problem. I started solving the problem out loud with her. Isn't If we had some machine learning to, to kind of steer him away from me to someone else, could have saved my hour, could have gotten to him more. And she said, I, I had the same thing happen. She said, when it's the right person, it's magic and I can help him. But when it's not, it's a waste of time. And she said, no, but seriously, how hard would it be to build a platform and we can get some people from our network on and we can help more people that way and you know, work smarter, not harder. I said, well, I'll tell you what, I could probably help with a little bit of, you know, the early stage ideation. She said, no, I needed to do this with me. I needed to be my co-founder and my co-CEO. And I said, absolutely not. I was still putting in about 100 hours a week and several at the time. I was like, there's just no way. And then, and then what she said, I, I couldn't really counter. She said, so you're telling me We've got this whole group of business specialists that know how to grow companies, and they, they would be excited to get involved, and they, they all love you, and they all love me, and she gets the kind of numbers I do on LinkedIn. And she goes, we know all these people. You don't think that you can have them actually do that heavy lift 
interesting. She said, what kind of leader are you? I said, okay, when you put it like that, you're right. So we put together a group of people that have all been there, done that. It's my job is to just be the conductor. And so that's what we've done. We've now got graphic and web people putting together the technology. We've got sales and marketing people working on our PR. We're talking to a couple of household names, some self-made billionaires that are super stoked on what we're doing. And the great thing is they were showing some interest, and now they hear about the accelerator component uh, and the linked out component where we're actually going to deliver some on, in-person offline sessions. And it just starts to really make sense. And I think through the accelerator lens of we'll help people in any capacity they want, but if they have an idea, we're going to help them launch a company. I think no one's really solved for that problem before. Everyone should check out mentoryouglobal.com. By the time we're publishing this, hopefully it's live. If not, just sit tight um, and, and check it out because you guys are doing some amazing things with that. Um, and what, and I want to kind of go back because you mentioned a few things about not taking outside investment and I know you bootstrapped this early on. Um, what made you decide to down the road take outside funding? Yeah, so we, we took very little. We actually, uh, we passed on a couple of even full buyout offers, but also on some larger investment and the valuation of the company based on revenue right now is still fairly modest. Um, yeah. And uh, and so I haven't wanted to dilute the company too much, and I've I've also wanted to maintain control, uh, kind of from a, from a leadership perspective. Um, but I'd say more so than that, uh, the reason that we took on a very small amount is just because we we finally got the product where we wanted it. We, we realized that marketing would probably be uh, astute, <laughs> so we really wanted to have a marketing budget. And as I grew the team, we really we, we have just some kind of early hires that. Uh, that we needed to make that we couldn't make without being able to cover a little bit more payroll than our revenue w was providing. So we, we took on you know, a, a modest investment and then it got us exactly over yeah. the hump and we've been able to deploy that capital and we're starting to see it come back to us already. Yeah. How do you decide who to hire? You know, it's, you said obviously it was you and the CTO early on. Who do you bring on next? So my next hire and he just celebrated his uh, one-year anniversary with us on the first. Uh, but nice. I brought him on board as director of operations, and he had spent the last eight years of his life in the B2B SaaS space, and uh, he'd been with a CRM company, and, and he'd been in the workforce management company. And so he had this experience in our space, but he also brought something to the table. Uh, he'd been a marine biologist and vet for many years. He'd also been a, a martial arts instructor for many years. And so he had that discipline. He had that scientific and, and kind of process-based approach. He had that experience and leadership in the B2B SaaS space. And uh, he really was fired for what we were doing as well. So he was my next hire. Um, and he really helped move the needle as well. Shout out to Andreas. He's phenomenal. Uh, and then what I did is I, I brought on a, a strategist who ultimately ended up uh, investing in the company. How did you attract someone like that, someone with that amount of experience? Uh, so he and I were both actually uh, brand ambassadors for Damon John for his recent book, uh, Rise and Grind, which was a great book, and, and he and I were both happy to promote it as entrepreneurs. And uh, that was kind of an on online plus experience. So we, we had a Facebook group, and then when he'd come to our cities, we, we'd meet up with him and help promote his book and that kind of thing. And I was promoting Shedwell pretty heavily in the space, and because he had experience in the space, uh, he actually sought me out and said, hey, this is kind of my wheelhouse. I'm looking for my next big thing. Uh, and he, he'd been, he'd, he'd been uh, you know, kind of in the entrepreneurial, like, you know, top, first 10 higher on the last company or two he'd been in. So he was kind of familiar with mm. the earlier stage uh, yeah. pain points and things like that. So he, he truly was just a godsend, to be honest. Mm. You know, Corey, um, first of all, I want to just thank you for your time and your, your expertise in sharing your journey. Um, I always ask um, at the end of the interview two questions, um, which is, since it's Inspired Insider, what's been a low moment and what's been a proud high moment? Because with you know, entrepreneurship, there's you know, ups and downs. And, um, I think I was reading for you, even like you went from, you know, uh, car repossessed at some point <laughs> yeah. to buyout off recently. So yeah, exactly. It's crazy roller coaster. Um, we'll, we'll let you, we'll finish on the, on the high note, but what's been a lower moment that, you know, we don't see the, everyone doesn't see the behind the scenes challenges. We just see what people put out, um, 
you know, people put their best foot forward in social media and everything like that. Yeah, so believe it or not, the, the two that you mentioned aren't even the high or the low, at least in my okay. perspective. Okay. The, buyout, the buyout offer actually came before the car repossession, <laughs> um, <clears throat> which, which is just kind of kind of funny uh, as far as the process goes. But I'd say about a year, year and a half into the company, um, I didn't, I didn't necessarily feel this way completely, but the people kind of in my in my circle, in my business world, thought that I was really kind of thinking it too seriously as a company and kind of taking it too much to heart, and we're noticing some changes. So they put me on a suicide watch with a uh, really? therapist for some time, and you know, it's just it is valuable to share that with people because that really is that emotional. And although I didn't necessarily think you know that I was feeling that way, the fact that my my inner circle had perceived it as such and taking the steps that they did. Um, really is just kind of an eye opener, and I, I do know I was taking it very seriously. And I probably never stopped, but uh, but I found the the silver lining. But so that was probably you know both both internally you know just to just to know that I was being perceived in that light and kind of casting that doubt um, was probably a low moment for me. Um, well, in addition to probably the hundred. Well, so so this was actually uh, an accelerator that I was in, and, and I was on location with with them for many months and they'd given me a, uh, an advisor that had been considering investing in the company. And basically just weeks before demo day, he said, Oh, you know, you might want to go get a day job. And uh, I just thought it was really uncouth. And, and I told him that as the only full-time employee that, that if I was to not be a full-time employee and the company didn't have a full-time employee, that I thought that that was going to be death to death to the company and death to the baby. And I wasn't prepared, you know, to do that at all. And I took it pretty tough. And I guess my, my reaction to that, you know, and there were definitely tears and screaming and all that, but I think the, the reaction that I gave... For some reason, I, gave, I can't picture you screaming. Huh? You seem like a pretty, like, happy-go-lucky <laughs> person, but... Yeah, until he, until he's threatened to kill my baby, right? <laughs> but no, you're, you're right. I don't, I don't scream often. Um, but And then I, I would say, so kind of through, through that lens of that being an emotional low point, where it just felt like no one believed in the company other than my co-founder and I. And, mm. you know, we, we'd been rejected by dozens of investors already at that point. And, and we'd had a lot of people kind of saying, Oh yeah, we're, we're probably interested. We might come in if you just find a, a lead investor and you know, all of this is really, you know, that negative negative, or at least it seemed negative kind of culminating with that mentor saying that was a yeah. super low point emotionally. And then I would say on, on the other side, you know, recently we've had a couple of days where we've done over a over thousand dollars in MRR in one day. And I think as a founder to see a company generating real revenue and watching my, my team grow and people making, making real money for themselves and for the company has been a super high point. So I think the, the first day that we did over a thousand dollars in the day and just actually seeing that number hit the bank account was probably my, my high point um, to date. It was just kind of like a proud parent. I, I felt like I was watching my, my kid get straight A's in fifth grade or something like that. Why did you decide to turn down the buyout offer? Um, well, so, so candidly, it was, it was a, it was a good offer, a nice offer. It was a multi-million dollar offer. Um, I counted with a hundred million dollars and then we had a laugh. Um, and, uh, but, but really I've always known the potential for this. We, we have companies in our pipeline that would represent, you know, strong six and low seven figures a year. Um, so to think about selling it for, for just, just a couple million dollars, you know, what wasn't even something I, I would have entertained and I've never, uh, never looked back or regretted that. Now, mm -hmm. it did turn out that the company trying to buy us uh, was authorized to go twice that amount. I hadn't known that. and That takes it from a single million to, to a double-digit million. Mm -hmm. and, and that it still still wouldn't have, I, I still have no regrets, but that was, it was flattering to know that. And, um, you know, without getting too, too into the weeds, the, right. the person that authorized that, that larger number to buy us out is now, um, now probably joining the company to a, our, our company to a capacity. So, um, it's cool to see things go full circle, but mm. it was super easy to turn that offer down. It was, it was flattering. It was, it was super affirming. It let me know that we were definitely onto something and that we're, we're, we're making the right, the right impression in our space. Um, you know, the, the company that, that tried to buy us is, uh, is not going to be an indirect competitor. Uh, and, and yeah, so w without getting too, too far yeah, into it, that's kind totally. of, the, <laughs> but the yeah, car the reposition came after that offer. Yep. Yep. Well, so you weren't thinking at all like, well, damn, I should have just taken that. 
No, not at all. Not no. not even for a second. I mean, that that that's right in the same veins of uh, of the guy telling me to take a day job. But this has never been. Uh, it, first of all, it's never really even been about money. But it's never been about a small amount of money either. Um, to be candid. Yeah, totally. Well, Corey, thank you. Thank you for sharing the journey and uh, your thought process along the way. Everyone should check out uh, Shedwool dot com. It's it's uh, s h e d w o o l dot com and mentor you. That's y o u global dot com. Any other places, Corey, we should point people towards online? Well, so the, the only thing I would say is that those are those are both great great resources, great places to go check out. If we can add value with with either of those uh, platforms, I, I'd love to. Love to get involved with all of your listeners, uh, but also I would say that just connecting with me on LinkedIn is probably a great thing to do. And I am right around the thirty thousand first connections. So uh, as this show airs, I might not be able to accept new connections from people. Yeah. In that case, what I suggest people do is follow me um, and then start engaging with my content because I can always find someone in my thirty thousand that's not as engaging. And if I start to see someone's name and they start adding value to my feed and Start start commenting with value add comments to my posts. I'll find I'll find room to uh, to make them a first connection, and yeah. from there we can message each other. I'm always happy to help any way that I can. So shedwell dot com is great. Mentoryglobal dot com great. Um, definitely check out those websites, but also uh, connect with me online. Uh, any any listener of this show is a friend of mine, so I look forward Thank to making you. some new connections. Thank you. You're more than welcome. Really appreciate it, and um, I just wanted to be the first one to thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure, Jeremy. Truly, I, I look forward to getting together for a cup of coffee or something someday as Definitely. well. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out.